everybody. Um, thanks for joining. And um, my name is Dorsey Sherman, as Skylar said, and I own a coaching and consulting company called Model Consulting. And um, I'm a board certified coach. And primarily, um, lately I work with individuals, leaders and executives focused on their own sort of um, personal growth and development. My background is as a lean practitioner and consultant. However, I work um, primarily in healthcare for some large health systems and I'm in uh, Michigan in the US. And, um, but really that took me to Toyota Kata coaching and then Toyota Kata coaching took me to the broader world of leadership coaching. So I, I just think what I wanna talk about today is kind of some of what I've learned about coaching and how it applies to lean and specifically the prop the process of change and individuals and kind of what emotions have to do with all of that so what do emotions even have to do with lean i think it's almost sounds a little ironic an emotion focused approach to lean coaching because i always um was thinking it was the opposite we're just trying to keep emotions out of lean right because isn't our job as lean consultants or coaches to really focus on data and evidence and um, facts and data. And you might think that emotions are kind of getting in the way of improving processes. Instead, we want to think scientifically um, and focusing on emotions might be a detriment to the um, work of process improvement. However, we can't really put them aside. We are um, emotional beings and um, our emotional selves are very much part of our day-to-day -day lives. And the more we learn and understand, um, I think we can be even more effective in our work as agents of change. So um, the case for emotional intelligence, I know you've all heard this term. It's very common. Um, nowadays, there's all kinds of books and research about EI or EQ. And the case where it is really kind of makes intuitive sense, um, but is also backed in evidence that technical or functional competence and knowledge, cognitive abilities can only take us so far. Um, our ability to think big picture, have long-term strategy or vision are important leadership qualities, but emotional intelligence kind of distinguishes good leaders from the really great ones. And so Daniel Goleman, wrote this book about emotional intelligence and he describes kind of the chief characteristics of someone with high emotional intelligence can be both able to be aware of their emotions and also regulate them. And then, um, so that's inward and outward. So inward, they're able to understand their own emotions and regulate them. But from an outward perspective, they're able to manage social situations from an emotional perspective and then um, be aware of emotions in a social or relational context. And so, um, yeah, and I think this is kind of an interesting perspective of the iceberg of, of the competencies that distinguish outstanding leaders or individuals, only a small percentage are, are cognitive or intellectual abilities. And what really is emotional intelligence? What are, we, what are we talking about? Again, it's this capacity to recognize our feelings, um, ability to motivate ourselves. And to me, these four quadrants are really an easy way to understand it. So on the left is kind of understanding yourself, managing yourself, and on the right, understanding others, managing relationships. So um, we always start with self-awareness, which means being aware of your own thoughts and feelings and how they're guiding your behavior and your decisions. We may think that um, you know, we don't have control over these, but actually um, our thoughts and emotions, sorry, I have something in my eye. I'm sorry, I'm gonna just try and get that out really quick. There we go, okay. So, um, so there's self-awareness is where we start and um, kind of accurate self-assessment. So being able to see yourself accurately and understand how others see you. And then understanding others. So um, the foundational skill here is really empathy, um, which means um, connection to other people's points of view, their perspective. Um, 
it requires you to become kind of a learner and to be curious, to be non-judgmental, understanding someone else's feelings and communicate their point of view. And then managing relationships, being able to develop others, inspire, influence, you know, manage change. And finally, managing yourself. The biggest takeaway on this part of emotional intelligence is I think managing our triggers. So we've all felt emotionally activated before and um, have been compelled to say or do something that we've later regretted. And that's when our amygdala, which is this lizard part of our brain, this primal part that controls, um, is always scanning for safety, gets emotionally activated, we react, and then our prefrontal cortex catches up and we say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that. Um, and that's really this self-control internal regulation part. So what, is it, what does this have to do with lean? Like, what does emotional intelligence have to do with lean? Well, you know, my friend Tony Benner um, introduced me to this idea that really, and it resonated with me, lean is really about learning. There's an R missing. Um, and I think we can all agree that at least some of lean coaching is helping people understand a different way to work a different way to look at their process, a different way to add value for customers. Um, and it's there's a teaching element and a learning element that's very important with lean. And basically the bottom line is that our ability to learn and change and grow is, is dramatically impacted by our emotional state. And so specifically negative emotions impair learning. So we get this stress response, um, which is sometimes called fight or flight. And even relatively mild emotions, nervous, um, you know, irritated, stressed, overwhelmed, sort of have this lead to this decline of cognition, creativity, and concentration. Specifically, they activate our sympathetic nervous system. And that triggers these hormonal processes that are happening in our bodies, which like shut down our brain. So the big learning for me here was I really thought, um, I mean, I think we've all heard of fight or flight, but I always associated that with a more like dramatic or intense emotion, like something like fear or anger or panic. But these are relatively mild things like irritation, being overwhelmed or stressed. Like you can imagine those happening daily. I certainly can. Um, and so even emotions at that level can really have this effect on our brains and our ability to learn new things and change our behavior. On the other side, positive emotions enhance learning. So positive emotions activate something called the parasympathetic nervous system. And that stimulates adult neurogenesis, which is literally the growth of new neurons. So um, things like feeling curious, optimistic, self-assured, interested, inspired, grateful, happy, cognition, creativity, and concentration are all elevated. And so, um, our ability to, um, you know, our thinking ability, our learning ability is, is greatly enhanced. And so we know that different types of coaching um, lead to different um, emotions. So before we go into that, I wanna talk about the word coaching um, <clears throat> because it is ubiquitous. Um, I think that there are all kinds of, I think that word is used in many different contexts and people, but yet people mean different things. Um, so for me, I kind of broke it down um, and I think it's important to think about the different way it's, ways it's used and what people intend. Um, even when we're talking about telling someone what to do, we actually call that coaching. Um, that's sometimes used in that context, conveying information, giving education, safety. You know, I always, um, when I was doing mostly lean work, I would say I was a lean coach. And really a lot of the time I was teaching, I was conveying information, um, even sometimes, um, you know, doing the work for them, understanding the current condition for them and still kind of calling that coaching. Feedback is called 
coaching, you know, maybe you observe some inappropriate behavior and say, oh, he really needs some coaching. And it's specifically a transfer of knowledge about dealing with someone's um, problem that needs to be fixed in some cases or, or, you know, positive feedback as well. Mentoring is called coaching and really that's giving advice, which of course is helpful. Um, but it's usually um, given by someone more senior, more experienced. Um, I would say it's distinct from coaching. Facilitation is called coaching. You know, a facilitator is there to really set an agenda and bring a group along to a specific outcome. Um, and then I'm going to talk in more depth about this in a minute. There's something called coaching for compliance. I did my uh, coaching training at Case Western in um, Cleveland and the researchers there coined this term coaching for compliance, which really means you're trying to get the other person to do what you want them to do. So you kind of, there's some organizational level of performance or some problem and you're there to close a gap. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk about in a minute a little bit more about the effectiveness of that. There's kind of coaching to teach a skill. So um, I would put Toyota Kai coaching in this space, music teachers, athletic coaches, um, they're trying to improve performance in a specific area. And then finally there's coaching for compassion, which is kind of, is also coined by the researchers at Case Western is um, this kind of the opposite of coaching for compliance. Coaching for compassion really means helping someone find their own way. The idea is to inspire them, light the fire within and, and draw out um, their goals and individual interests and desires. So um, those are all called coaching, um, I think. So I, I always think it's interesting to kind of compare and contrast and see what we're talking about. I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into um, these coaching for compliance and coaching for compassion. But I think for all of those examples, the goal is the same, which is interesting. The goal is learning, growth, and development, whether it's feedback, mentoring, telling someone what to do. The goal is usually behavioral change. Um, but I would say there's varying degrees of effectiveness. Um, to dive a little more deeply into coaching for compliance, the aim is really um, compliance for an individual to um, follow a certain standard. So even this is um, kind of the default for athletic coaching, teaching, doctor-patient relationships. Um, you know, patients are even called non-compliant um, when they're not following the specific treatment guidelines that were developed by the doctors. Performance reviews, um, are kind of coaching for compliance. And so even when well-intentioned, so this is the connection back to emotions, even when well-intentioned, coaching for compliance can elicit this defensive response from the person being coached. And people tend to experience a stress response accompanied by negative emotions, activation of the um, sympathetic nervous system, and then our cognition and creativity is impaired. On the other side, coaching for compassion, which again has the same goal, which is much more focused on helping someone find their own way, an emphasis on positive emotion, focusing on strengths, tapping into internal motivation, um, has a really positive impact on people. And so what I think is interesting is where does lean coaching fit in? Is it coaching for compliance or is it coaching for compassion? And for me, the answer is it depends. It really depends a lot on our, what we believe is our intention and our, and our purpose and our beliefs about while we're there. I think lean coaching can very easily be in compliant, be in this camp of coaching for compliance because I know that's how I have delivered lean coaching myself. And I think it can also be very much in this space of coaching for compassion. So I'm gonna talk a little more about that. But what I would say is the reason why I think this is so interesting is despite good intentions of lean coaching, I have experienced, I've delivered, I have witnessed coaching that was well-intentioned but ineffective because of the negative emotion that it created. So part of this is because I think lean coaches get really focused on the rules. Um, 
you know, there's all kinds of things like we have to go to Gemba, make sure you have new data, target condition as to have an achieved by day. That's, I'm a, my, have a lot of experience in Toyota Kata, so that's kind of an example related to that. You need to find the root cause before you propose a solution. You need to have a process metric and an outcome metric. And, um, you know, you never want to start with a solution. So here's where it's tricky. These rules are all in place because left to our own devices, we're not naturally good at thinking scientifically or solving problems. You know, we're out there playing whack-a-mole and randomly implementing solutions instead of kind of methodically going about the process of improvement. And so, um, in fact, the, all of these rules are an antidote to our poor problem solving abilities. We need the rules to unhook us from our cognitive biases and these rules can really turn into like compliance policemen like coaching um, to our learners, which can lead to this kind of negative response. So you might be thinking, what's wrong with coaching for compliance? We've all seen athletic coaches um, on the sidelines screaming and yelling at their players and they get results, right? I mean, there's people that don't care about compassion whatsoever. And they're um, winning games. And, you know, even within the workforce, they're getting outcomes and re results. Um, and so what is known, though, is that this type of approach really doesn't lead to sustained growth and development and performance over time. It tends to be finite. Um, and I think at work, we're looking for not just a short-term increase in skill, but, you know, lifelong learning and understanding. So this negative feedback or even correction can create defensiveness. So there's a fabulous article called The Feedback Fallacy in the Harvard Business Review, where they tested two groups and one was given positive feedback and coaching based on their strengths and connecting to their individual professional dreams and aspirations. The other was told what was wrong and what they needed to fix. And um, in the group that was getting the negative feedback, this fight or flight part of their brain lit up because a threat was perceived. Activity in the brain narrowed and uh, the access to neural circuitry was impaired. It led to literal cognitive impairment. And so in the students that focused on their aspirations and how um, they might achieve them, the parasympathetic nervous system was activated, this rest and digest system, and the functional MRI showed um, improvement in cognitive functioning. So, so we learn most when we focus on and are able to create these positive emotions. So you might be thinking, well, that's not me. You know, if I'm a lean practitioner, I'm really nice. I'm not like a jerk out here who's like, um, you know, making people uncomfortable or creating all these negative emotions. And as I've talked about this concept of lean coaching and negative um, emotions or kind of the emotional response that's going along with it, I've had all kinds of people tell me stories um, about the negative things that they've experienced. So um, this was a quote, a lean expert was coaching me in front of a group of peers. I didn't know the answer. I was embarrassed. I didn't think I was smart enough to be there. My brain went blank. And I think that those choice of words are so interesting. My brain went blank. It's like when you think about the purpose of any interaction with a lean expert or a lean coach, it's about learning. And the idea that someone's brain is blank because they're frozen and embarrassed um, because maybe they don't have the right answer or haven't taken the right step is literally the opposite of the impact that we're trying to have. Um, <clears throat> I got off my last coaching session and wanted to cry. Someone messaged me that. Um, my first time in a lean conference, coaches were criticizing their learners um, for all they were doing wrong. And I felt intimidated. I felt awkward confused and frustrated. So I guess I ask you to consider, have you ever experienced a negative emotion during the lean coaching cycle? Um, and, you know, what was that like? And you might be thinking, again, this isn't me. I'm really nice. I have good intentions. I'm not 
um, worried about being a policeman or overly focused on the world on um, on rules or anything like that. I meet people where they are. I think people always have good intentions and they can still have a negative impact. So this was another quote. I had a hostile uh, coaching cycle. It impacted my work for the rest of the day. In a culture where I work, lean is impossible. Workers shut down because the coaches are driving too hard. So I ask you to consider for yourself, um, have you ever experienced you know, a negative emotion either while you're working with someone or um, um, being coached by someone else and how has that impacted your ability to learn? Um, here's what's happening from the positive emotion. Barbara Fredrickson is a positivity researcher and she found out that um, when people experience positive emotions, it doesn't just feel good, it literally changes our brain. So specifically, it expands the inventory of thoughts and actions. I think that's is so compelling because what could be more important for the work of lean, which is adding value to our customers and achieving kind of innovative goals that add value and remove waste. So positive emotions actually expand the inventory of thoughts and actions, which then develops physical, mental, and social resources and advances um, positive, advances personal growth and creates even more positive emotion. So she specifically recommends this ratio of five to one. So there's all those, um, we all, we've all heard like, oh, you have to be uncomfortable in order to learn or there's no growth without discomfort, things like that. And there's all this research around like productive struggle. So in order for you to learn, it should be a little bit hard. And that's where it's kind of this interesting dosage issue. Um, it's not like it's all unicorns and rainbows and we're sing sitting in a circle singing kumbaya or anything like that. But the ratio of positive to negative is there's a sweet spot of five to one. So five positive emotions for every negative one um, seems to be a really good place to be. Um, and so when you're in this um, space where you're um, five times, having five times as many of these emotions on the left side that are in green as you are on the right side. So mostly you're interested, inspired, joyful, hopeful, curious, and feeling grateful in a very small percentage or irritated or sad or embarrassed or disgusted. Um, there's this potency of the positive emotion that makes it really useful to solve problems because we see options, we focus on goals, you find solutions to complex problems, um, you trust in the good intentions of others. The positive emotions really broaden people's ideas about possible actions, um, opening our awareness to a wider um, range of thoughts and ideas than what is typical. Um, so again, um, it's really a dosage issue um, as much as anything. And so from an individual coaching perspective, I found this really fascinating. When I work with people one-on-one -on -one from a leadership development perspective, people always think you wanna start with, here's what's wrong, here's where the problems are, um, here's what I need to work on. I'm not good at this, this, and this. And what, uh, so I use a model called the intentional, um, <coughs> um, uh, the model of ideal self, which is really focused on um, um, the positive. In other words, identifying your vision and your values and your purpose and your strengths, spending a lot of time on that as a way to um, tap into individual motivation. And then, okay, let's also understand, you know, where is there, where is there a disconnect from those ideals and where you are now? Okay, knowing that, where do we want to move forward? But when anyone wants to start with a problem, when it's always like, okay, but where are you doing that really well? Are there parts of your life where, let's say you want to work on um, being a good listener at work, but actually at home, you're a great listener. So we spend a lot of time talking about that. So 
it's almost what I almost feel like the opposite of how I started practicing lean was like, where are all the problems? Tell me all the problems versus what's actually working. Let's leverage that. Um, so a little bit more about the emotion, specifically joy sparks, the interest to be, to play and be creative, interest sparks exploration and learning and positivity um, generally makes us more receptive and open and creative. Um, and again, if you translate this to the world of improvement, um, sparking, igniting, maintaining, creating, mining for positive emotion could not be more important. It's maybe even the key. We really have to have kind of hope, excitement, and feel eager about moving forward. That's what creates change. People tend to achieve more in a more sustainable way when they're in a positive state, both psychologically and physical, um, psychologically and physically. So BJ Fogg um, was the keynote speaker at Katakon 7, hosted by Lean Frontiers, um, not in 22, but in 20, uh, 2021. And what, what I loved, he wrote this book called uh, Tiny Habits. Um, and uh, of course, Kata is a lot about the work of skill development and um, habit development. And his key point of his keynote speech was that it is not repetition that creates habit, it's positive emotion. So not, we've all heard where, oh, we have to do this 21 times in order to create a habit. So you can create a habit really, really quickly, much quicker than 21 times by um, having a positive emotion associated with that behavior. Um, so how do we move forward? What does this mean for the world of, of coaching? So um, there's this really interesting graph, um, I think, that talks about what are the factors that impact employee engagement? And really the answer are the relationships um, that we have at work, specifically the leader member exchange, which is a relationship between a leader and a boss that causes a sense of um, perceived organizational support that this organization cares about me. That then leads to engagement, satisfaction, commitment, retention, discretionary effort. Then engagement leads to organizational performance. So in other words, it's our relationships um, that we have with each other. And I would say that coaching is a relationship that leads to engagement, that leads to performance and specifically high quality connections in an organization aren't just nice to have, but they're really vital and um, can lead to creating engagement and the positive emotions that leads to results. Um, connecting with others is really at the heart of human nature and um, research emphasizes that the power of connections can help us be creative and resilient um, and people think that kind of compassion and connection is sort of this nice to have or this soft skill, but this actually leads to um, um, people feeling like they belong and genuinely care about each other, leads to creativity and resiliency. So how do we mine for positivity? We can learn a lot from the world of appreciative inquiry. So there's a book called SOAR. The Thin Book of Stort, um, Sort, um, written by Jackie Stavros. And the focus here is really this positive approach to thinking and coaching. Um, her thesis and research is that our organization will go in the direction of the questions we ask. So instead of saying what's not working, we ask what is working? How do we do more of that? Um, so as she uses the SOAR really stands for strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results, where, again, when I first started practicing lean, it was all about what's the problem, what's not working, versus the opposite of that is what are we great at? What are our unique and dynamic capabilities? How are we already contributing to the mission and vision? And what are possibilities? How can we add even more value for customers? What are our best possible market opportunities? What are what do we dream to be? What's our preferred future? What are our aspirations? So these are all the kind of questions that just by the nature of how they're asking have put people in this rest and digest state where they're feeling a lot of positivity and leads to a lot of creativity and openness about 
about what's possible. Um, and so as we think too about, um, you know, our own emotional self-awareness, I think it's interesting to think about what is the purpose of a lean coach? The answer is really connected to a set of beliefs that shape kind of how you see the world and how you see yourself. It influences how you think, how you feel in any given situation. So for instance, um, if you believe your job as a lean coach is to be there as the expert, solve the problems and get results, that's different than your job is to develop people's ability to solve their own problems. I would say those are two very different belief systems that lead to different thoughts and behaviors and emotions and have a different impact. Um, so I just think that's an interesting question because, um, and I'm not really trying to say that one in this space is necessarily more effective. Um, it's really just um, building that awareness around what you believe your purpose is. Um, whether it's a partnership or, you know, is it a mentorship or an expert or a sensei, um, just some questions for you to consider. Um, Mary Lee Adams wrote this book, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life, and um, she offers this judger learner mindset where um, we're always either in judger mode or learner mode. So a judger needs to know the answer, enjoys being right, wants to look good avoids the discomfort of uncertainty, is opinionated, sees themselves as the expert, and the learner is okay not knowing the answer, finds joy in exploring, discovering, and learning, expects to grow from mistakes, and wonders, what am, what am I missing? So these mindsets exist in all of us and create different emotions and different ways of showing up. Um, they lead to different questions, which we're asking both internally and of others, um, for instance, and I write these because these are thoughts that I have thought myself, the judger might be thinking, why are they so resistant to change? Why is this manager so ineffective? Why didn't she do what she said she was gonna do? Why is no one listening to me? I can't get through to these people. Why don't they do what I say? Um, so when you're in that space of judger, either judging the people you're working for or judging yourself, um, that's creating this negative emotion in yourself that's then um, impacting the people you're working with. Versus the learner question might be, I wonder what they're thinking. What emotions am I experiencing? What assumptions am I making? How can I help them? I wonder why they aren't taking any action. And it's really not to again say that anything's good or bad as much as awareness about the connection between um, your own thoughts and emotions and the impact that they might be having. There we go. Okay. So how might we bring um, positivity coaching for compassion into lean coaching? Um, there's a couple ways to do that. The first is really what I think is to focus on that relationship because that's what creates the engagement, which creates the result. So these high quality connections. And that means really getting to know a person, caring about them. Um, and this might require time outside of just your specific lean work. Um, another interesting thing is does the coachee or the client really care about the challenge or the issue? So often these, um, my experience was that lean initiatives or directives came down from senior leadership um, and there wasn't necessarily buy-in or support at maybe a director or a manager level when it came to actually striving for the improvement. For instance, um, when I was working in um, healthcare systems, patient satisfaction was a big priority and a strategic initiative, um, mostly because um, more and more um, reimbursement and funding was connected to high patient satisfaction. And so that was a strategic priority and that was then cascaded through the different inpatient um, 
inpatient units of the hospital and the nursing directors and managers were responsible for moving the dial on patient satisfaction. Well, through kind of basically nonverbal cues, and this is sort of the, um, you know, outward awareness, outward emotional awareness of understanding what's happening in a room, I, um, many of us were seeing like, there's not really buy-in to this idea of improving patient satisfaction. Um, there wasn't really motivation around that. And so through some conversation, we came to understand that nursing was interested in improving the quality of care, but really didn't see their job as improving satisfaction in the sense of I'm a professional, it's my job to take care of you. It's not necessarily my job to satisfy you. And they compared it to maybe a teacher. It's like, it's my job to provide you a high quality education, not necessarily satisfy you. So that's where I think things can go awry in terms of we get into compliance coaching, like, okay, here's this directive or a strategic direction that we need to improve this process, but there's not really buy-in or support for it. And that's where without internal motivation, um, you're not going to have the positive emotion that's so critical to learning and growth and development and the progress that, that we're looking for. Um, so working, um, I really believe in, in that regard that challenges and directions should um, come from the client, from the learner, as I would say in a Toyota Kata language. It's really leadership's job to cascade meaning and purpose. And then at, an, at a manager level for them to decide how they best connect to that and, and what they're motivated and that they have influence over that can affect that. This five to one ratio is really being cognizant of what are the, in an hour meeting, what is the ratio of positive to negative emotion here? And it's not that we want to have unicorns and rainbows, but we definitely want to keep it to be a positive experience. And so how do you do that? Um, you know, it can be focusing on what's working um, um, and positive feedback, identifying strengths. And you're not just managing and understanding the emotions of other people, but also of yourself. Um, what am I doing well? You know, our, so our brain is wired for negativity and that's to keep us safe. So we're constantly scanning for what's wrong or what could be a problem. And we have to kind of counteract that to be like, what's working? What am I doing well? Um, and that's from our perspective as a, a lean practitioner and as a lean coach as well. Um, we know that we grow and we improve and we develop from our strengths. So it's important to just be aware of um, what's going on within ourselves in order to really mine for that positive emotion. And so <clears throat> the other impact of managing emotions within ourselves is um, something called emotional contagion. So in terms of self-management, um, it's the impact that your emotions have on other people. And so this makes, again, intuitive sense. We've all had a conversation with a friend or a colleague that is hopeful and passionate, motivating, um, and you walk away feeling a little more buoyant. Similarly, it's common to feel um, deflated uh, after an encounter with um, someone expressing fear or anxiety or outrage. And this makes, again, intuitive sense we've all felt um, or kind of been around a, maybe a boss that's frustrated or angry or annoyed and then watch the room, the mood of the room change from maybe neutral to cautious um, to fearful and maybe disengaged. And so it isn't just good to know, it actually affects organizational results. Um, so here's a quote, one of the oldest laws of psychology is that um, anxiety beyond a moderate level um, erode mental abilities. Um, more positive emotion at work um, is the strongest predictor of satisfaction and therefore predicts how likely employees are to quit. Um, in this sense, leaders that spread bad moods are simply bad for business. So your mood really affects other people. Um, and so that's where the emotional intelligence comes around being aware of your feelings and emotions and how they're impacting other people. Some specific habits around coaching for compassion. Um, so 
I'm going to turn my light on really quick. It's like got really dark in here all of a sudden. Hold on. I'm going to flip my light. Okay. Sorry. So um, we have these two networks in our brain. One is called... Um, so I think the neuroscience of this is just fascinating. Um, one is this empathic network and the other, sorry, that's my dog, um, shaky. And the other is the analytical network. So one network actually suppresses the other. So we can't access both empathic and analytical networks at the same time. So when our analytic brain is activated, our empathic brain is suppressed and vice versa. And much of lean work is quite analytical. You know, it's very task focused. Um, it's very technical. And so I think it's important to realize that when you're in that space, your empathy is actually shut off. And I think we can relate to this when, when you're focused on getting something done, you're not really thinking about connecting to how somebody's feeling or like, um, what's going on with them? You're like, I got to get through this agenda, or we've got to make a, res we have to get a result here, or we've been working on this for three months and we still have no positive outcomes. You know, when you're in that mode of driving, you're disconnected from your empathic network. And so our ability to make connections and connect and have resonance with people is limited. And so it's not about good versus bad. And we can't always be in this empathic network. You know, we need to have this focus on, um, you know, um, technical change and in, in, in our analytical work. The ability is kind of this awareness and that tension and flipping between the two. So how do I balance relationships and empathy with task and progress um, and getting things done and like how do I hold the tension between those two spaces in a way that's kind of effective. Um, so I guess one final um, thought is kind of what some feedback that people have given me is isn't it just about intention? If I have a good intention um, and I just care that the, that my client or, you know, the person I'm, my learner is really learning, isn't that all that matters? Can I, um, if I have a good intention, everything's good, right? Can I compassionately coach for compliance? Um, and the very short answer is no, you know, positive intention does not necessarily, does not necessarily mean a positive impact. Just because you have a good intention doesn't mean you're having a positive impact. Um, it doesn't mean your learner or client or coachee is having a positive experience. I think people by and large have very good intentions. Um, they want the best for their employees and their organizations, and yet people have negative experiences all the time. Your intentions really aren't enough. Um, when I do executive coaching, part of uh, the work together is doing a 360 degree feedback and people are always surprised on the feedback they get and where oftentimes their intention and impact is aligned and it often isn't as well. Um, there's feedback like, wow, I didn't know they saw me as a micromanager. I'm just really focused on doing things right, for instance. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And I guess I leave you with an invitation to consider the questions that I'm asking myself. And that is, are your learners, your clients, your coaches experiencing more positive or negative emotions? How do you know? Um, how do you really know what someone's feeling? Um, how do these emotions impact their ability to learn? Oh, I know, that makes me think, I wanna go back to one slide. So Lily Boyanova is a kata coach and um, we work together. Um, I was actually second coaching her. She was coaching. And one thing she would ask her learner after a Toyota Kata coaching cycle was, how was that? So she would do the coaching cycle. They would go through the improvement exercise. And then it was almost like a pause in the cycle and say, how was that? And then the learner might say, well, that was good, or actually I'm really frustrated or I'm overwhelmed. And she, so, so I think that's a really interesting 
way to specifically, you're almost asking for feedback or you're checking the impact that you're having. It's kind of like saying, how are you? How was that? And it's not something we usually do, um, but it's such a specific and structured, structured and tactical way to understand the impact that you're having on someone else um, as a coach. So I always appreciate that and, and do that myself. Like, how was that? Um, uh, so I wanted to be sure to highlight that and I'd forgotten that earlier. So, so that's the, that's the answer to the question. How do you know, how do you know the positive or negative emotions during your coaching is one way to, how do you know is to ask, um, how was that? You know, how are you doing? And, um, when, if you do think there's negative emotions, how do you think they're impacting, um, their ability to learn and what do you notice about your own emotions? Um, and I really believe that when we have compassion for learners and there's resonance between coach and learners are, are the most important thing. Anything is possible. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, I'd love to, we have some time for questions. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn, I'd love to connect with you and continue the conversation. Dorsey, thank you so much for facilitating today. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who attended. Also, just a quick reminder that you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Again, thank you so much, Dorsey, and thank you to everybody who attended. We'll see you later.